Uh, Burt's treatment of the Second Amendment suggests to me that his holistic approach is, may be uh, simply another example of the standard approach by which courts and commentators evade rather than apply the meaning of the text, uh, the meaning that the text does provide. Step one is to start with the words of the text, say, freedom of speech or the equal protection of the laws, to discern the principles that underlie its words and uh, it underlies its words. So underlying the freedom of speech may be the importance of expression, let's say, or a free exchange of ideas, or a freedom of thought, or lots of things. Underlying equal protection of the laws is often said to be the principle of equality. Having identified the underlying principle, which is always by assumption extra textual, step two is to take the principles and start applying them directly to cases and controversies. In other words, those who appeal to underlying principles abandon or leave behind the particulars of the text and replace it with abstractions that are either more or less open-ended than the text itself. As Justice Black observed in his dissenting opinion in Griswold versus Connecticut, quote, one of the most effective ways of diluting or expanding a constitutionally guaranteed right is to substitute for the crucial words or wor word or words of a constitutional guarantee another word or words more or less flexible and more or less restricted in meaning, unquote. Now, while I disagree with Justice Black's opinion about the outcome in Griswold, I agree with this observation. The history of the Supreme Court is replete with narrowing as well as broadening uses of underlying principles. For example, during Reconstruction, the Supreme Court appealed to allegedly underlying principles to evade the original meaning of the Reconstruction Amendments, eventually leading to the result in Plessy versus Ferguson. And in, the, and, and in the New Deal, it appealed to broader underlying principles to evade the enumerated power scheme that rendered an expressed appeal to constitutional rights uh, much less necessary than it is today in the absence of an enumerated power scheme. Now, my point is not that one need never recur to underlying principles to resolve issues of ambiguity or vagueness of the text. Rather, I maintain that when one plunges beneath the surface of the text to discern the principles that may lie beneath, one must then apply what one learns to the text itself. One should not take the principles and make them a substitute for the text, never to return to what the Constitution actually says. So, Burt must not only tell us why we should use holism when engaged in constitutional construction, to be faithful to the elegant structure that is the Bill of Rights, he must continue to use the text as he finds it, not the lovely poem he may wish it to be. Thanks. I, th I think the panel will function from this level from here on for the rest of the program. But before we take questions from the floor, and I would encourage those of you who would like to participate in the discussion simply to come to the nearest microphone, and in a moment or two we'll uh, have a chance to uh, uh, invite you to participate. But uh, Professor Bur uh, Newborn, perhaps you want to, in a very short manner, respond to well, Professor well, Barnett. First, let me say there. Is this Tom? Yes. Yeah. Uh, first, let me say that there is no greater honor than to have your piece read carefully by someone who you respect. And so, thank you, Randy. Um, uh, the uh, um, uh, Randy makes three points, and uh, let me quickly respond to the three. The first is when he talks about um, uh, uh, the the uh, using a holistic reading to provide more information about what an ordinary reader in the uh, ordinary highly intelligent reader uh, uh, in the founder's um, time would take from the document. Um, and that, I think, is my, the strongest argument for holistic reading. Um, uh, I, uh, we may have gotten into the habit of reading things textually and uh, of clause bound and word bound, but I suspect the people who were looking at the Constitution and deciding whether they liked it and wanting to ratify it in the the various conventions um, and the people themselves, they didn't look at one piece, they didn't look at one word, they didn't look at one clause, they looked at the entire document. Uh, and if what you want to do is recapture the psychology of a people who are adopting a foundational document, you do not recapture that psychology by reading it in clause-bound or word-bound ways. Um, the best way to recapture that psychology is to read it as they read it, as a single coordinated whole, and to try to capture the ethos of the document uh, that they were uh, either um, accepting or rejecting. Second, uh, Randy is absolutely right uh, that when that information runs out, um, uh, my urging that you read the document holistically then provides, I think, the most accurate and the 
best way of using, of going to construction. Because once the words do run out, uh, there is a degree of discretion that is placed in a judge or uh, uh, in the people themselves when they're reading the document and trying to decide what it means to them. Um, uh, once the words run out and once using all of the information we can about the psychology and understanding of the uh, original uh, founders, um, uh, we, we have to make choices. And my suggestion to you is where better to found that choice than in an intense engagement with the text itself, um, uh, with the holistic uh, no uh, nature of the text itself. Um, and that if you rank the various ways that judges make decisions in this area, um, I would have no hesitation, if there were time, to debate um, 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 uh, that holistic readings, really intense engagement with the order of the ideas and the, and the structure is the best way to do that, the safest way to do that, and the, most, and the way to do that that is most respectful of the text. Now, Randy's third criticism, and, and this is a real one, um, what about when I use hol uh, uh, holistic reading to actually subvert the text? or if not subvert the text, to do something that um, um, is beyond a construction of the text, but is almost a substitution for the text. Now this is the most, would be the most controversial application of my, of my work, um, and perhaps it, it is wrong. I mean, perhaps he's right to say that it is wrong. But let me say that I deploy it only in one setting. I deploy it when respect for the text would mean that the text um, has either drifted into desuetude, and therefore, we're not, it's gone. I mean, uh, um, um, 200 and 250 years have left the text without contemporary meaning, or to give it meaning would be to give it an almost absurd meaning. Um, and I know that this is an audience very committed to the individual rights reading of the Second Amendment, but let me suggest to you um, that what you have, what we're going to develop soon is a right to bear muskets and a right to bear handguns. So um, um, uh, you're going to have handguns, you're going to be able to have rifles, uh, but you're not going to be able to have anti-tank weapons, you're not going to be able to have 105 millimeter howitzers, you're not going to be able to have sawed off shotguns, you're not going to be able to have exactly the weapons that you really need to protect you against um, uh, 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 tyranny. Uh, what you have is symbolic weapons that you can wave and pretend that you are somehow protecting freedom from a standing army. Uh, there's no way to protect against a standing army with a handgun. So either the, the Second Amendment is a kind of anachronism or, it's, or it disappears into desuetude as saying that uh, once upon a time the militia was the organized armed force in the society and you had three different kinds. You had a militia, you had the standing army, and you had private law enforcement. And since the, since the standing army and private law enforcement were profoundly unrepresentative, you needed a militia to check them to make sure that they didn't become tyrannical institutions. Well, what happened in the 19th century is we invented two things. First, we invented law enforcement that is public and that is at least democratically controlled. There was no urban police forces at the time that the Constitution was adopted. There were no formal police forces. There was the posse comitatus, and there was the local, local people could have their own private police forces. Um, but we developed an urban police force subject to democratic constraint. We also perfected, and, and, and this is the citizen's army. Napoleon developed the citizen's army, thus the Civil War tragically perfected it. Um, um, an army of the people. And so what used to be the militia has morphed over time into the police and the citizens' army. And the question is, do you want to make sure that they remain microcosms of the people, or will the, will the, uh, um, will the organs of armed coercion be made up once again of unrepresentative institutions? Uh, unre unre uh, um, and now, uh, I, I, I understand that that's a very controversial reading of the Second Amendment, um, and I don't really assert it as more than an intellectual, um, um, uh, uh, especially given the way the court's going. I don't expect that it's going to change the court's decision. 